Aloha and welcome. I am so thrilled to have such a wonderful, um, inspirational person on the show today. It's Kabir Sagal, who's an American author. You wear so many hats. You're a composer, a producer, Navy officer, military veteran, investment banker, financial executive. And I don't know how you can do so much work with your New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling author of 12 books. I know how hard it is writing a book and writing 12 best-selling books, plus five Grammy Awards and three Latin Grammy Awards, record producer, and um, very, very inspirational person who always seeks to do something that takes it to the next level. And I think that's what I love about you, Kabir. Welcome. Thank you. Aloha. It's great to be here on your August show, and I've long admired um your program and thanks for having me on. Well, the latest project that I'm just enthralled with is uh, one that speaks to my heart in many levels because it ties in the breaking down of barriers, the breaking down of walls, the reaching across borders and the way music joins us all together. And that's something that I've always felt, music heals, music brings us together. There's no separation in music. So obviously, this is one of your inspirations as well, right? Exactly. It's, it certainly is. And I've long believed that art and activism can be uh, blended in a way. And we started on this project called Fandango at the Wall. It really started out of a conversation. I'm a longtime collaborator with Arturo O'Farrell, a wonderful legendary Latin jazz musician. He and I were just having dinner. And he said, you know, Kabir, I came across this article in a newspaper and it's about this man named Jorge Francisco Castillo, who is a librarian at the border wall between the United States and Mexico. And he puts on this festival across the border wall. And uh, I looked at the article and, you know, as a producer, I try to help materialize the visions of the artists that I work with. And I said, all right, maybe, maybe I should call this guy. So I, I started calling all the libraries in San Diego, found him. I said, Jorge, we want to come and um, learn about your festival. And Ultimately, it was through conversations among Arturo, myself, and, our, and Jorge that we started this project, Fandango at the Wall, which started as a record, uh, an album, live music album at the border between the United States and Mexico. It also turned into a book, which I wrote on the history of Mexico and America. And it just finished uh, our culminating um, aspect of this is a feature documentary, which debuted recently on HBO and it's available on HBO Max. We're really proud of it. It's the first film I've ever been a part of and produced. And it's very exciting to be, um, I guess, creating a platform for San Rocha music, Afro-Mexican music on a big platform such as HBO. Well, as you know, it's one thing to write a book and it's a lot of work that's on the part of the author. I mean, you, you probably do a lot of basic prep. And then it's another thing to try to create a beautiful album to get another album that gets a Grammy is another whole realm. But to do a movie costs a lot more than either of those, doesn't it? Oh yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a heavy lift. Uh, we've been working on it. Uh, I mean, for four years, and you know, films take a long time. And something um, felt big about this project because there's a there's tension, right? When you say Fandango at the wall, Fandango is something that's beautiful. Fandango is just a big party. A wall is something that's kind of divisive. So in that title, you have something that's positive and something that's kind of tears us apart. So there's that tension there. And I said, you know, if we're gonna to go to the border wall and do a concert, we should probably film it. Problem is that I never actually made a movie. So, and I didn't know anyone in the film world, but I was at a book party, a launch party um, at one of my book parties. And I met someone in the audience and he said, oh, I work in the film industry. And he took my, I took his card. And then uh, when I decided to make this movie, I just sent him an email saying, hey, I'm looking to make a movie. Do you know any directors? <laughs> he sent out an email to like some some people in his network and next thing you know I was on the phone with our terrific director Varda Barkar and within a few weeks after that we were filming and we just sort of took it one day at a time and one obstacle at a time and that's sort of a philosophy of life for me just do one thing at a time and pretty you just do it day by day and pretty soon you're down the road and down the field and um and it was, it was an exhilarating project to be a part of. And I got to tell you, just making a movie is just, it's very, it's, it's so engaging. Everyone's streaming videos on Netflix and HBO these days. And I, I'm able to get my family to just sit and watch a movie 
in a way that I can never get them to watch or listen to an album continuously. So it's been, a, it's been, a, and I now have the movie bug. So I don't know what we're going to do next, but I need to find something. You know, I hadn't even thought of that, but that's a very good point. I, I had not put that idea together that to sit someone down and listen to a whole CD or an album is one thing, but yeah, to get a, a whole group of people or even a family together to watch a movie is a much easier thing. And, and you were able to bring in some rather heavy hitting people as producers. I mean, how did you get Carlos Santana on this thing? Yeah, you know, a lot of these folks are, were inspired by the message. And um, he in particular, I think was taken by the, just the heartwarming nature of the music in the film. So often filmmakers focus on the more tantalizing parts of Mexico, the, the violence, the, the narco um, trafficking. Our um, film, we, we talk about that stuff, but our, our film is much more about the music and the Mexican middle class and San Orocha music. This is the most beautiful art form I've ever experienced because when you go to a Fandango, there's no one there asking you for a ticket. You just come. And there's no division between the audience and the artist. Anyone can just sing out. And it's this huge just jam session centered around the Tarima. And so I think when Santana and when Quincy Jones and my godfather, Andrew Young, when I, you know, this, this project- you Your godfather's Andrew Young. <laughs> correct, correct. And so like, he, they, they really believe that music is, was really the anthem of the civil rights movement and, and music can, can bring about change in a positive way. So um, that's why well, I think, you know, it, the music's touched not only them, but so many people in this story of just how music can bring us together. Did you go to like Carlos Santana first and then get after that, then you get other people? Because I know it's easy even get one person, other people get excited to get on board. You know, I don't remember the exact order. I remember just like, you know, when you're producing, it's just kind of like, you're just trying to make everything happen at once. I need to go back and look at how it happened. But no, I think, I think, um, you know, in terms of just, we wanted to make the best film. And I think what was so important to that was getting the advice and counsel of some of these sage voices. Like when I talked to Uncle Andy, for example, he would always say to me, like, you know, you had to focus on the story first. And so we did that. It wasn't just a music film. We went into the intimate portraits of the artists because you can always make a, an album, but you know, cinema is, is really about stories and how do you tell a story through the, through the moving image? That is so key. And you know what? When I was watching um, sections of this, this is exactly what I got. I got that, you know, and sometimes documentaries, I literally love documentaries, but I, in fact, I went to USC film school for documentaries, but you can fall asleep really easily in a documentary, but there's so much life and heart in this and Arturo is, is such a pure soul and as is you know just the feeling of that music does convey the warmth that you were expressing and I didn't know and, and yes you learn I didn't realize that a fandango I didn't even know what a fandango was and it's terrible you know I was raised in Los Angeles the borders right there been to Mexico never heard of a fandango wouldn't imagine it's free but there is that and there's the um the heartfelt Scenes, there was a moment where you had fingers, the baby finger touching through the wall. It was so heart-wrenching to see people on one side of the wall and some on the other side of the wall just trying to only have enough space to touch fingers. That, Where did you get that? I mean, to be able to show that so, said so much in that moment. Yeah, there was a moment in the film which we captured. There were these three brothers, the Vila Lobos brothers, who are from Veracruz, Mexico. And they come down to the border and, uh, you know, two of them are on the Mexican side and one of them was in the U.S. side because of immigration issues. And uh, when you go to the border wall right in Friendship Park there in, in San Diego, there's only, there's a mesh. So the music can go through, um, but there's only a little bit of room where you can touch pinky tips. And so we started calling this the, the uh, Fandango high pinky salute. And so whenever we would see people on the project, we would just lift our fingers and go like that as the international sign of the Fandango. Um, and so it's it's man-made, right? That we see in the film, the, the wall goes into the water and then it vanishes. And so these lines we draw between us are, whether they're 
physical borders, whether they're genres of music, those are man-made too. So on this project, we had, you know, Mandy Gonzalez, who sings in Hamilton, um, Anna Tuju, who's a rapper. We had all kinds of genres. That's not reflected as much in the film, but all kinds of genres on the album because we said, you know, musicians can also create borders. Though I'm not an expert in this music. I'm not, an, I don't know much about that, but at the end of the day, it's just frequencies, you know? And and so I also do want to say, um, Cindy, don't feel too bad because Fandangos are not really well known about in parts of Mexico either, because we did our we did our um, post production in Mexico City. It was very important to me that this is a cross cross collaborative um, cross cultural collaboration. And um, while we were editing, a lot of the folks in Mexico City had never heard of San Hiroshi music. Uh, they had never heard of um, this type of fandango that happens. It comes from Veracruz, which is a you know eastern state in Mexico, but it's not unlike you know here like. I'm here in Atlanta. I don't know that much about Hawaiian music or I don't know that much about Gullah music. It's a regional music, but there's something really beautiful about this art form um, that's so immersive and welcoming. You can have, you know, hundreds of people show up and to sing together. And there's, um, there's a, a beautiful spirit to, to, uh, to this music. What did you learn? This has got to be a huge learning process to do a film and make it on the scope. You had some heavy hitters, you know, that you had to come through for here. So there was a lot riding on your shoulders. Now you had a wonderful um, director, right? And you had great producers. So what part did you try to play in the role or pretty much you just say you do your thing? How did you weave your own understanding and knowledge of what you wanted to express through the people you were working with? Well, a lot of it was um, trusting the artists and trusting people um, on the team to do what they're good at. And so, you know, when I talked to our director of art, I said, it's your film, like create what you think is a beautiful project to focus on the art. And I'm gonna focus on everything else, the resources, the personnel package, the distribution. And once an artist is freed from some of those more, I don't know, uh, not mundane, but certainly important, but more business aspects of a project, they can really create. And it's almost, you know, a lot of independent artists is sort of a one person team. But when I try to join, uh, it's like, I try to be a force multiplier and say, okay, you just focus on the music, I'll take care of everything else. And in this case, it was really a matter of just also because it's a documentary, we really didn't want this to be just a talking head. This is the history of San Jose music. We wanted this to be cinema verite. Like there's no just, interviews everything you see in that film is as we learn it we're like traveling we're learning on the fly we're talking to people um and so this whole idea of discovery you're the audience is discovering these people just as we're discovering them and there's you know there was a little bit of planning but it's so what did i learn was to i was initially resistant to that i was like we should probably know what we're going to film but i I learned i kind of needed to let go and let let um people who knew what they were doing like a great director sort of lead in that way. And she's a woman, yay. I mean, to be able to have that as well in there, it's beautiful, lovely. The next big step, and I mean, I know I've done a little bit of this work. Editing is huge. Editing is sometimes a lot more time consuming than shooting. Um, So how did you go about, did you leave that up to her to find the editor or did she do the editing? Because editing is always very important in getting the story out right especially the case you're right in documentary filmmaking. <clears throat> I was talking to a, a feature filmmaker for a scripted film. And I said, you know, how much does the editing process matter? And he was like, you know, it, it matters, but once you film it, that's basically the story. But in documentary filmmaking, you film all this stuff. And then in the edit session, you're just kind of stripping away layers and you're just trying to get to the story. And a lot of things don't make the cut because you know, you think you know what the film is going to be, but it ends up kind of different in the edit. And that's what's kind of beautiful about it. It is, you're really just chiseling. And we went through so many edits um, and we edited in uh, in Mexico City. And I was there with Varda uh, going through that. And then of course there's a the sound and getting, making sure, cause this is a music film. We want to make sure that the music does, is, is the sound quality has been doing justice to the music. So certainly, certainly, um, we had a great editor um, in Louisa, and she was she really fell in love with this music, and and uh, 
I just think it's important. It's so important that you have people who love, love the subject matter. And I think because we had a Mexican team working on a project of this import, they really took to it. And I'm so grateful we had a, I should just say we did have Matt Porwall. Matt Porwall is a, um, I think he's like the best cinematographer um, for documentaries out there. He shot Cartel Land. He, um, I think he's an Emmy Award winner. His and Cartel Land went to go, I think get nominated for an Academy Award. And so I've known Matt for a long time. And the way he's, he shoots some of these shots, it's like he is a, he is a musician himself because we wanted to break down that wall of going to a Fandango, that there is an, there's not really an audience. You just sort of are immersed in the music. And the way that the camera moves, it's kind of like water. And uh, I remember Varda saying to him, we're going to kind of do it like this. And then when he said, okay. And then when they finally got to it, the scene, Matt was like, are you sure you want me to do that? Because every director says that they want me to do it like that, but then they sort of shy away. He's like, no, no, I want you to film it as if you're an instrument. And so you'll see in a lot of the shots is this kind of floating. And that's what's to replicate the, the sound currents. That is such a beautiful idea to have that creation of like it's floating like the music and and you can come to that because you know your music so well and you've done all this work with music i think that's that's beautiful the next big stage for any documentarian and i know some beautiful people have done wonderful heartfelt docs hours and thousands of hours over the four or five six seven or eight that some of my friends have done but the biggest issue then is how do you sell it? How do you get it out there? How do you distribute it? It's 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 the stumbling block for many people. Uh, many people can say, okay, well, maybe I can get it on PBS at that, you know, and if, you know. So for you to be able to go to HBO, did were you able to make that entree, or how did you get it to HBO? Yeah, you know, we actually finished the we're finishing the master cut. Um, I think earlier this year in April or May, and. We um we certainly wanted to um we certainly wanted to submit it to film festivals and we and we did but then the pandemic was happening and we were like and we were, we had some great really great offers we were offered to be you know opening night film for a couple of big film festivals um so we knew we had a good project on our hands but then you're right how do you connect the dots and so we we were like should we wait until after the pandemic was over or should we just kind of and then talking to Jorge and talking to others, they say, you know, right now, there are no Fandangos happening anywhere in the world. And so this would be great medicine for everyone to be sort of reminded of what a Fandango is, so people getting together. So what I did is I was in Miami. Um, I know some folks at Sony Music down in Miami, and because I'm more plugged into the music world. And I sent my friend there this film, and he saw it, and he called me right away after seeing his Kabir. I saw this film and we have to be part of this. He said, you don't understand. Like when I go and travel to Latin America, I'll go to like Brazil or Mexico, Costa Rica, and I'll go sign the big pop star. But when I'm meeting with their families, I listen to the music that they listen to in the streets, in the neighborhoods, in, you know, in the farmlands. And I wish I could convey that music to the Sony audience. I just, you know, I can't sell that music much. That's not very commercial music, the campesino music. When I see this film, I believe this is everything that you know we, we should represent. And so when, when Sony got on board, they know the folks at HBO, I don't know anyone. And so they have a kind of a pre-existing relationships and they took it to HBO and it was kind of a similar reaction. They were like, we love this film because of not just, I mean, there was obviously the, the music but also what's going on in the body politics. There's an immigration aspect here. There's the wall, there's, and so we would love to feature this. And so we engaged with the HBO team, HBO Max team, HBO Latino team, and it premiered um, a few months ago. And it's been, I think it's been doing well ever since. And, and since then we've been doing panels and talking about it. That's kind of how it happened. And I've heard all these stories about how it's hard to find distribution. Um, and it, prob it probably is, but in our case, it was, just, it was just one thing at a time. And so we're trying to you know, bring the film to Mexico. So I am sort of now <laughs> trying to find distributors there because we're getting a tremendous demand of people in Mexico to see it. Um, so hopefully we'll have some news to share um, when we can. Would that be, then how would you handle that? Is HBO got a distribution service in Mexico or no? They they do. I think, well, I think we have some um, interested parties and we need to figure out what the best oh. fit is for the market. So Sony is really handling that, which is cool. Um, 
but it's really, you know, it was really an awesome thing to have these great partners on board and integrate a platform for a work such as this. Well, when you think about it, there's no way you could have shot this film if it had been this year. I mean, so you were really blessed because you were able to do the shooting that you needed to do and capture it and then do the editing, which is fine to do in some innocent environment like this. And because of that, in a way, we are all so hungry for being able to see inspirational and uplifting pieces, to be able to see this is a true gift. And also to be able to hear it, I don't want to leave out the fact that you made, there's a fantastic soundtrack and the book, um, which people can get. And I think, you know, who, what comes first? You know, the car, the horse, the music, the movie. I mean, you know, it'd be, it'll be interesting to see it. Do people see the movie like they do on some great movies and then they get the book? Um, or do they listen to the music and then they go to the movie? I mean, it'll be interesting, but possibly you're right. Possibly the movies have a big stretch and by seeing this amazing documentary, then they'll want to maybe get the book and hear the music as well. Exactly. Well, I think the upshot here is if people um, engage in any part of this project, what I hope is that they go to their computers and just type in Fandango or San Hirocho in their city that they're living in. If it's, if it's um, Honolulu, or whatever, there's a Fandango community in so many places across America, even in Hawaii. Really? And so you can go to Fandangos in many, many, when the world opens up again, and I encourage everyone listening to go to a Fandango in their community and you'll meet, you know, a dozen or so more friends. And it, it's, it's an incredible experience. So people can go to Fandango at the wall. If you just Google Fandango at the wall, what's the best website to go to? Best website is Fandango wall, fandangowall.com. And you can find us on Facebook, Fandango at the wall. You see all our updates and, and engage with us there. And if you go to Amazon, um, you can see the book for the best site. I guess Fandango Wall would take you to the al um, the album you have out as well. Would that take exactly? You? We're on all platforms. So you go to Fandango Wall, FandangoWall.com. You can see a link to uh, the music, a link to the Amazon, um, and a link to find us on social media. Well, it's a major accomplishment. I mean, and to be able to say this is your first documentary, to be able to do something that is as powerful as this work is that touches your heart, that educates you, that breaks down the barriers and, and makes right some of the wrongs that happened over the last few years, that the things that separated us and brought fear and brought anger and brought hatred, this helps so much to erase that. I mean, it helps to really bring us together as human beings to understand, you know, we all have these gifts that we can share and the gifts that you see are very present and, and are really brought forth in this movie with your wonderful team. I mean, a dream team, of course, but I mean, I just thank you so much because this is, you know, just doing this alone, if you didn't do all the other works, this would be an accomplishment that some people would say, this is all I need to do in a lifetime. And I know that you're not one of those people, but, <laughs> but for some people, <laughs> there's some people that say, this is it. So, um, and, and, and for someone that's young and as creative as you, I mean, what an amazing thing. You're going to try to do more movies? Are you, are you going to try to do other documentaries? I'm going to try. I'm going to try. We'll see where we go with it. I do, um, I need a good idea. So if anyone listening has a good story idea, I'm always um, willing to listen and collaborate. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Kabir. Um, truly, I mean, you inspire me. You do. You're a very giving person. And I, I've had the honor of knowing really how much you care and how many people you've helped. And um, it's really touching. So thank you so, so much. I'm very, very honored to have this time in your busy schedule to talk to you. Thank you, Cindy. Really a pleasure. And I admire you very much too. Aloha. Aloha.